Okay. Very good. Okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, it's great to have you all here today with us. Um, this is the, the last Knowledge Cafe for 2023, so that's exciting. We've uh, we've done, this will be our ninth cafe for, for the year, um, and this one will be a little bit uh, different and special, so it's great that we have, uh, we'll be having such an interactive session for our, our last one for today. Um, and I know some of you have been with us uh, for each each of the nine cafes, but we also do have some um, who are new with us today. And so for those of you who are joining us for the first time, i -Cords is a community of practice that centers around the social and behavioral sciences in the field of neglected tropical diseases. And its purpose is to bring people in this field together to learn and collaborate with each other. And one way that we do this is through our knowledge exchange cafes, which help us hear from experts in the field and to hold a discussion on the concepts shared and learned. And so during the session, you're welcome to put any comments or questions you have in the chat. And then we will uh, address those questions and comments when we get to the discussion portion of our session, uh, which will take place after our speaker and panel uh, sessions today. And so in our session today, we will be hearing from, we will hear learnings from the Redress Consortium on the use of innovative visual methods to design, pilot, and evaluate integrated health system strategies for the improved management of skin NTDs in Liberia. And our first two speakers today are Rosalind McCollum and Wede Tate. Rosalind McCollum is a postdoctoral health systems researcher with 14 years of health-related experience. She's originally trained as a medical doctor and holds a PhD in international public health and has experience in health systems research and project management. And prior to joining Redress, Rosie worked as a humanitarian aid worker in Iraq, supporting Nineveh DOH with strengthening the delivery of primary health care services during the immediate post-conflict period. So thank you to Razi for joining us today. And we have Wede Tate, who is a research fellow with the Redress program. She obtained a Master of Public Health from Cuttington University in Liberia and studied healthcare management in tropical countries at Swiss Tropical Institute of Public Health. She provides support in the design of effective integrated strategies for the sustainable, acceptable, and affordable case detection, referral, and treatment of SSSDs. And welcome to Wede Tate as well. And so the session will also include an interactive panel discussion that is facilitated by Shireen Chowdhury, who is a research assistant with the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. And so thank you to all of you for taking the time to share your knowledge and expertise with us. I think this will be a very exciting and interesting uh, session we have today. So I won't uh, take up any more time and I'll pass it over to Razi and Shireen. Hi there, um, it's really great to be joining with you all today. Um, really delighted to be able to share with you um, some of the, uh, the work um, from Redress. Um, and I'm really delighted to be able to be here um, along with um, some other of our colleagues from Redress to be able to share that with you. Uh, so um, yeah, I'll, I'll start us off. Um, as I said, my name is um, Rosie McCollum um, and I'm a researcher at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. So this is just a brief overview of um, what we'll be um, touching upon and talking about today. Um, uh, so we'll go through um, a few slides. Uh, I'll start us off and then my colleague Wede um, will um, take over and, and finish up the presentation before we move on to the panel discussion. So Redress has really been shaped by uh, participatory action research approaches. Um, and this has really been quite central to Redress right from the start. Um, and Redress uh, aims to reduce illness, stigma, social exclusion and poverty caused by skin NTDs. And this is um, really sought to be done using a person-centred approach um, by putting the needs and the priorities of um, people with lived experience um, and those also with um, experience of um, providing and delivering um, care for persons affected um, at the centre and at the heart of 
redresses um, community engagement and involvement values. Really, um, you can see here um, that they have a lot of similarity um, with um, principles um, for um, participatory research. Um, really, at the, at the heart of it is um, uh, the focusing on the sharing of power. Um, research, we really seek to ensure that research is jointly owned and that people work together for shared understanding. And you, here you can see um, one of the participatory activities happening with persons affected um, by skin entities. Alongside that, we seek to build and maintain relationships, respecting and valuing the knowledge of everyone involved in the research, including um, a range of different perspectives. And um, so this includes um, the perspectives perspectives of um, persons with lived experience, but also those um, who are per perhaps um, often uh, not included in um, usual health research. So um, people such as informal providers like traditional healers and faith healers have also been included throughout this process as well. And then we also work to um, uh, with the aim of ensuring that everyone benefits from um, the process of working together. Central to this um, uh, are the um, experiences um, of um, those with lived experiences and co-researchers cool um, have really been an integral part of our team helping to shape and to guide um, our work and um, we're delighted that one of our co-researchers, um, Jella, will be joining us as part of our panel discussion today. Um, we work along with um, peer advocates and also with community health workers um, and because of their um, the role that they play, they're able to provide us with unique insights and uh, to mentor us as researchers based on their own lived experience, um, of skin NTDs um, and also of working within the system. Um, within our participatory approaches um, for redress, uh, we sought to establish community advisory boards within each of the implementation counties to help to shape and guide us in terms of the research and also the development of the intervention within redress. There was also a Ministry of Health Technical Advisory Board, um, which included many of your typical stakeholders, as well as persons affected and other community actors involved as co-researchers. We also used a range of different participatory methods um, and we'll be sharing some more details about some of those methods uh, with you later in this presentation. And then um, sharing learning is also important and so we're really delighted to have this opportunity to be able to share some of these learnings today and we look forward um, during the discussion at the end to hearing your own experiences and um, learning from you as well. So as we were thinking about participatory approaches and participatory research, we really sought to try to think through about power. Um, and power really matters to redress um, because um, often those communities um, and those persons are considered who are considered uh, disadvantaged and marginalized. Very often they don't have um, a say in the agendas of the health research projects that aim to help them. Um, and even when engagement does occur, um, often actions um, which are taken can lead to tokenism and um, where underlying power dynamics are not adequately considered. And so this has been something that we've sought to um, try to reflect on within redress to ensure that um, actions are meaningful rather than tokenistic. Um, and some of the ways in which we considered power was that we sought to try and apply and think through um, uh, some of the um, power cube, um, which was um, thought through by um, uh, Gaventa, John Gaventa, and um, we use this really to kind of help to um, to shape and to direct um, a lot of our research and um, actions with regards to um, intervention development. Um, this slide just con contains a snapshot of some of the different ways in which um, we sought to consider this. Uh, I won't go into all of them um, just because of time, but um, you can see here we sought to uh, involve Ministry of Health actors from the national level um, throughout the research cycle um, as well as uh, also seeking to be reflexive to that. We're also delighted that one of our Ministry of Health actors, um, Emerson Rogers, will also be joining us on our panel to um, share his own reflections as well um, later. Um, another kind of way in which we sought to think about power was ensuring that people affected are um, invited and uh, joined uh, join as co-researchers and again the use of participatory methods as a mechanism as well to to progress that. Then um, we also sought um, to um, consider power in some of the invisible ways um, by engaging with um, patient advocates and working with different patient organizations to try to help to um, develop and think about different advocacy strategies. 
Um, so this really helped to try and um, shape our participatory action research cycle, um, where we sought to have initial formative research, where we um, uh, tried to understand and reflect on the challenges. Um, and here you can see some traditional healers who are part of that formative research in the photo at the centre. Um, and um, through kind of reflections with them and with a wide range of other stakeholders, um, we sought to pull this all together um, to, um, to move into then the planning phase where um, solutions were jointly developed together um, with a really wide range of stakeholders, um, uh, including persons affected, informed providers, community health workers, health workers at, at um, a range of different levels within the health system, um, those from within the NTD division, but also other, um, other departments as well, such as mental health and community health. We then sought to implement those actions. And so we had our intervention period where, um, where the intervention um, was, um, was ruled out. Um, and this included a, a range of different components, such as training, supportive supervision, um, and then um, set the establishment of peer support groups for persons affected. Um, and, um, yeah throughout all of this, really seeking to um, consider and to reflect on um, the mental health of persons affected. So integrating that within intervention as well. Then we moved on to um, uh, evaluate what we had done um, and um, we're finalizing our analysis of that at the moment. And then um, we're now just preparing to um, move into the knowledge, um, knowledge translation aspect of it with our um, disseminations planned for county level starting next week. So I'll move, hand over now to my colleague, Wedi, uh, who will be um, taking us through the next part of our presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Rosie. I will present on the participatory methods that we used during our research here in Liberia and how they promote equity. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, so photo voice was one of the um, participatory methods that we used with the community health workers and also the informal providers during the formative phase of the research. And it was used to understand the forms of care that the community health workers and the informal providers provide for these persons affected. And it was also used during our um, intervention to evaluate our intervention by capturing the experiences of these persons affected that we work with in seeking um, care um, and the, their, in their care seeking journey and the impact of their conditions and well being. As you can see to the left is the faith healers going through the photo voice processes, creating themes. And we also see our co researcher talking to an affected person discussing her photos that she had taken. Next slide, please. So in promoting equity, photo voice is actually a visual learning method that provides flexibility to understand people's experiences. And then it also provides the opportunity for those that are marginalized, the people, especially the people with the skin entities and those with limited literacy to enable them actively engage in the research processes and also for them to critically think about their care seeking journey and reflect on their well-being and how it has changed over time since redress intervention. And it also allows them to focus on themselves as the experts of their own lives. So having um, conducted a photo voice in three of our intervention counties, we presented the findings to the county health teams of each of the counties and also to policy makers. And these implementers created, they had interest in the photo voice platform and they, 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 they built a platform as well to understand the link between the formal and informal providers for the aspect of the intervention. Next slide, please. Another method that we used during the research study was body mapping. For the body mapping, usually we have um, the affected persons come together and we also observe gender keeping um, the males in one room and also the female in one room, females in one room, females in one room, so that they can 
openly and, and, and discuss their conditions because the reason for separating them, take for example, if you have male and female in one room and the male has hydrocele, he will feel very, very uh, um, disappointed in expressing his conditions. So usually we have them together, like um, separate, separated, sorry. And as you see in the photo to the right, you can see the leg that they drew, the one to the left side looking at the screen is a Burudi also patient with the red ink around it. That's Burudi also. And the one to the right is a lympho leg, lymphodema leg. And this is how they capture their experiences, looking at how the skin entities has impacted them physically and mentally. And also it provides a non-threatening way, like I said, so they can freely express and discuss their conditions. And this serves as a way of motivation, knowing that they are not alone and they have other people that have these conditions that they can discuss together. Next slide, please. So another um, participatory method was the reflective diary. And this was used during the baseline and throughout the intervention. And during this time, we work with um, the, the health workers and also traditional and faith healers. And the essence of the reflective diary is to have these people who provided books, diaries, and to have them reflect on the activities relating to skin diseases every week where we had the co-researchers go to them because some of them could not read and write. So we gave those ones recorders and the ones that could read, we left them with the um, booklets so that they can write what they had experienced over the week because these traditional and faith healer engage with the affected persons most times before going to the health facilities. So that's how we um, trained them, created and the link with the community tracker tool called the local listen link that they can link patients affected to the health facility. So we had the core researchers who serve as a bridge between redress and the counties and these participants and affected persons in the counties so that they could help them if they cannot write with a use the recorder and they go and they explain and these core researchers wrote down things that they had experienced. So this was how we used the reflective diary throughout the intervention. And we found it most valuable with the health workers as compared to the traditional healers. And the next one was the ripple effect where we had our core researchers from the three counties, Jala who's on being one of them, we had them in one room and then we gave them posters to individually um, reflect on what their experiences were over the course of the um, intervention period. And this was what they did. They, each person reflected individually. And then afterwards, they came together as a group, like you see in the photo up, each one of them holding the individual um, writings, reflections. Um, and at the bottom, we brought them together, all together, and then we came up with various um, things that came up during their experiences in the research study. As you can see below is the joint one that we put together. And then um, these co-researchers um, did a good job. They were able to reflect keenly and deeply on things that happened and we had an interesting um, session with them. Next slide, please. So um, potential for continuing use of these methods with the ministry programming relationship was, relationships were forged between the core researchers, the Ministry of Health, Health and greater inclusion of the persons affected. So doing um, all of redress meetings that we've had over the, the study period, we engaged with these core researchers and the Ministry of Health and these affected persons so that these actors can clearly see um, um, our affected persons, hear the story and understand what is unfolding as it, as, it, as it relates to the conditions. And then also exploring options to continue the community advisory board, which is a board that was set up in collaboration with the county health team to be able to go and conduct awareness out in the different communities and also stand as an advocacy group for persons affected. 
And then there was adaptation and inclusion of some of the participatory methods in our in the in the routine programming, like the use of the, the, the ripple effect, which is effective in programming. And then sustainable sustainable continuation of the peer support group, which was established in the counties, the three counties, and seed funding was given to them to come up and um, come up with things that they thought they could do, like soap making, that they will use these monies to um, get medications and also um, sell and return and have discussions. And then formal registration of the organization for these disabled people to make them to feel a part of a whole and their voices can be heard. Thank you. Thank you, Ede. And I'm Shireen Chowdhury, and I'm a research assistant um, working on Redress 2. And today we're very excited to have on our panel um, myself, um, Emerson Rogers, Jala Kesele, and Wede, who you've already um, heard from. And so, first of all, I'd like to come to each of you individually and ask you to please introduce yourself. Um, so, Jala, uh, please could you introduce yourself and please could you reflect on methods? that you've used in redress. Okay, my name is Chara Kezeli, community health services supervisor from Lofa County to be specific, Terawaya OPD, Wonjama City, Lofa County. And I also work as a Just full checking researcher. Just you can hear from us, Chala. It might be connection. We can hear uh, Jala speaking. I'm wondering if it's your double laptop that's maybe making you not hear him. <coughs> While we wait for you, okay. Jala, we'll just go on to ask sure. Emerson. Um, Emerson, yeah. please could you introduce yourself and reflect yeah. on methods used in redress? Okay, as I said from the beginning, I'm Jala Kesari. Can you hear me? Jala, I can hear you. I'm just going to message Shireen. Please continue. Wow. Jala. Oh, I'm so sorry. I think because my volume was low. <laughs> Please go ahead, Jala. Can you hear us? Yeah, I'm hearing you, Clara. You can hear me now. I'm so sorry. Please go I'm, ahead, Jala. I'm, okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Please, our technical issues on it's, our side. Yes, <laughs> yes, okay. Okay, Jala. I'm Jala Kesari, uh, a core researcher for Redress and a community health services supervisor as well from Lotha County, to be specific. Terawaya OPD in the Wenjoma Lova County. And uh, my reflection on the entire issue of redress has to do with the photo voice. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Java. Okay. Uh, using the photo voice, it actually helps to build my understanding about the impact of NTDs on the life of affected persons or persons affected. Most especially using the photo voice or the photos that the photo voice participants were using in the field, they actually describe the feeling of these affected. We understand that they have a kind of mixed feeling about the community, about the friends, about relatives, and so on. So you will observe that majority of the photo that were taken by the photo voice for participant, it actually shows their emotion. For instance, I saw a photo with a photo voice participant describing a kind of a lunar area where the affected persons were sitting, describing the world they always go and seek to a kind of a lonely place because comedy people have rejected them. So they have no friend to associate themselves with. They will have to go and seek to that kind of a lonely place and they probably in the evening hour before they enter the town. Some will also describe how they are being mocked by the community people. Hello. Hi, Chala. We can hear you. Thank you. Okay. 
how they are being mocked by the community people. Olifo Dima case, excuse me, Olifo Dima case express a photo that I saw showing us that a, a particular lady were looking at her and then she was carrying food on her head. But then while looking at her, begin to laugh at the woman that had a turn about Olifo Dima. So unfortunately for her, she stomped her toes and everything that was on her hair fell on the ground. So that how I mean, the woman said, but wait now, why should you keep looking at me? And then you, when you stomp your toes, look at the damage that you have caused. So we kind of a thing that you are looking very sorrowful in that moment. So she began to feel bad about herself. She said, well, so every time people keep looking at me, every time people keep at me, doing things all the way because of my condition, it's no need for me to be sitting in front of the road to sell market. It better I be in the world. So she also described the area that she will go and hire herself in though she will be there until people have left from the farm to go uh, from the time to go to the farm before she comes out to other fresh for water to go and take back. So we observe all of these things from the photo of us, you know, participant. And another reflection has to do with the, the reflective diary. The reflected diary were giving a ledger, some were giving a recorder, just as what they said, some were giving a recorder. So from the recording to the tablet, we also observe a lot of challenges that the people are faced with. This did they express her feeling of how she had been left alone, most especially her, her married man was an affected person. Of bully also. Over a period of time, about 10 years to 12 years, she been, I mean, suffering under that man from place to place to seek care until the man got well. We observed that. Then, after that, she encountered the same bully also. All of a sudden, the man escaped from her. So she will live alone. She will have to go and take quality, go on a farm, breast butch. May farm, Aero farm, Castawa farm, before she can get food to eat. I mean, all of those things that we went through, those are all reflection that people, uh, affected persons actually express to us. And we also see that they, they actually need care, they need help. And then uh, for me, as a community health services supervisor, it also impact my knowledge because we will have to go in from the beginning and never actually take the NTD cases as a kind of a case, as a priority. From the beginning, I never prioritize them. Probably other friends prioritize them, but I never prioritize them. So the CSAs in the community also never prioritize them. They will see them in the community and they will pass by them. But when I went through the redress intervention, and I observed that the effectors need priorities. They need to be talked to. For many people also need to be talked to so that to reduce stigma against them. Because Thank it you. is because of stigma, they all have gone to where they are not to be. Thank you yeah. so much, Jada, for your really valuable reflections um, and the really important reflections as a co-researchers. Um, and we really like the way you described how um, photo voice and reflective diary really made space for persons affected to express the stigma that they were facing and actually give visual examples of what they were facing. And really interesting to hear about how it's had an impact on your role and the important role you played within the community now in addressing stigma. So thank you so much, Jella. Um, and now I'll please go on to ask Emerson, um, if you could please, our next panel member, if you could please introduce yourself and also reflect on some methods. Thank you um, very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Emerson. Please go ahead. Thank you. 
Okay, my name is Emerson Rogers, and uh, I served as the intervention coordinator for the redress research. Sorry to interrupt, yeah. Emerson. I'm wondering if maybe uh, you should turn your And I also off. serve as the national coordinator for case management and CDs. And uh, um, by reflection, hello. Hi, Emerson, we can hear you now. Sorry, there was some um, um, difficulty, some breakup before, um, but we heard your introduction. Thank you. Um, please carry on. All right, so let me just begin. I'm Emerson Rogers. Yeah, I'm hearing you. My name is Emerson Rogers, and uh, I serve as the National Coordinator for Case Management of Neglected Tropical Diseases at the Ministry of Health. I also serve as the intervention coordinator for the redress research project. So, by reflection, um, we involved with the intervention phase. Um, that phase has to do with the training manuals and in order to coordinate with major stakeholders. And uh, those the, um, community, the um, mental health unit of the Ministry of Health, and also we partnered with Carter Center with uh, technical support from the redress team in the UK, we were able to develop a comprehensive integrated intervention training manual to be rolled out in the redress intervention counties. Uh, but most interestingly, for the clinical aspect of the training manual, uh, we already had an existing case management training manual that was being used by the NTDs program to conduct training for health workers and community health workers. So the the thematic group assembled these uh, existing materials and then built on it by including the mental health components and also the community health component and also included the training manual. So write training manual that has been um, adapted by the program to be used as a routine case management training tool. Now, what struck me most was the integration existing gap from the time we started TDs. We have not been addressing the NTDs patients or persons affected mental status. But with the inclusion of mental health in NTDs into the training manual and at all cadre of you know, healthcare providers, whether formal or informal healthcare providers, that includes the traditional faith healers. We are able, especially at the health facility level, the health workers level, you know, can now holistically approach our patient when they are assessing the and inclusive of the patient 
methods that was, that was not been done previously. And um, which is very, very much coming. So training with conducted in the free intervention counties as my Emerson, thank you so much. I'm so sorry we're having a bit of a break up with the connection. I'm not sure if you can hear us. But in um Due to the connection we had previously developed this slide, um, Emerson had developed this slide to just to talk through. Thank you so much, Emerson, for your really important uh, perspectives, especially from the Ministry of Health. Um, and these are some reflections um, speaking to what you have said, Emerson, but really in how have participatory approaches um, been useful for the NTD programme, and um, in, especially in terms of equity. And so you really touched upon the role of persons affected uh, within redress and developing the redress manual, which was a training package, um, looking at case detection, management, um, referral, and also included mental health and stigma. And you also spoke to the co-researcher role, being innovative and building the skills and also bringing understanding from their perspectives. And they really informed a lot of the um, all the different processes of the, the research cycle within Redress, but also the implementation and the evaluation. Um, and you mentioned as well, Emerson, and I hope, and I'm, we apologize for the technical difficulties, um, but a really key reflection from Emerson was on the integration of other stakeholders, especially working with the mental health, the community health actors, and the diagnostics unit, which you mentioned, Emerson, um, and that this wasn't being done before. So the participatory approach has been um, effective within um, the Ministry of Health and how you work. Um, and your lastly, the point you shared with us was working more collaboratively as a team, more so than previously. So we thank you so much, Emerson, for sharing, and apologies for the connection issue. Um, and now I'd like to go on to the last question and reintroduce uh, Wede back. Uh, Wede, can you please tell us what has been your key learning about participation and inclusion throughout Redress? So my click, my key learning, sorry, I didn't use the video because of the terrible network. So my key learning um, in redress as it relates to inclusion has been with the reflective diary, working with the fit and traditional healers within our redress intervention. Because before these um, health, these not health, but the traditional informal providers, fit healers and traditional healers were trained by redress. They, they previously worked in total isolation. And then through redress, doing our work with them, we came up with a Venn diagram to understand the relationship between the health system and these informal providers, which gave a beautiful insight, looking at them working in isolation, because here in our, our health, in our context, they usually have these people in their shrines or in their churches, and then these people stay and get worse in their conditions because they believe in themselves that they can truly help these affected persons. So with redress intervention, we have created that link using a community tracker. Like I said earlier, they look listen link where the traditional healers would look at the patient, listen to what they say, and then see if they can handle these conditions if they can't. In that case, we expect that with the linkage to the health facility, these traditional healers we send these patients to, a, to have access to formal health system care and treatment. And with the training, we also train them along with the health workers, different phases, different phases and different times. We train them to try to combat the myth about NCDs because it was always indicated that it was associated with witchcraft, which is just a serious total myth that affect, that keep these people to be more stigmatized 
and, and, and discriminated in their communities. So with redress intervening from the health system, looking at the health system through the informal system, it really yielded a good result. Patients, they are now working. They call the, the entities focal points at the, the, the county levels to inform them that they have these patients. And then the health um, worker, the entities focal point, go to their praying rooms or their shrines and then look at the patient, patients, do assessments, and then take these patients to the facilities. So with redress um, own intervention during this um, um, research, we think that it yielded some helpful, fruitful results in helping these affected persons. Because sometimes they also could not even read and write. They don't understand. They just use their own judgment to treat these patients. And they were there being supported by the co-researchers. If they don't get the NCD focal points, they linked also to the co-researchers. And then they try to coordinate amongst themselves to ensure these patients, affected persons, have access to formal care and treatments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mede, for those valuable reflections, particularly how networks have helped and the inclusion of not only formal health workers, but informal health workers working with the faith and traditional healers um, in the intervention and also in the research itself. And I just wanted to ask you, Mede, did you have any, you mentioned you worked with um, traditional healers and used reflective diaries as a method. Did you have any challenges um, and how did you overcome them? So the key challenge was them not being able to read and write uh, um, during the, the course of the reflective diary sessions. So if they don't read and write some of the challenges, they tend to forget. They tend to forget some of the activities that they had uh, and gone, been experienced, some of the things they had experienced in relation to their patients. So most times when you have the co-researchers go to review their diaries, they tend to forget most of the things. So um, one thing that we, 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 we put into place was to allow the co-researchers to do weekly visits with them because of the short memory, the illiteracy rate, considering all of those. So these researchers, co-researchers were actually instrumental in ensuring these um, traditional and faith healers who were illiterate to be able to to. to to help them get capture the key information that will also help in the linkage of the affected persons to the health system. Thank you so much, Reddy. And it's great to hear how the methods were adapted and especially the support and the important role that the co-researchers also played. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much to our panel members. And we apologize again for the technical issues on our side. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Um, I would now like to pass over to Rachel to um, over to our question and answer session. Thank you, Shireen, and thank you uh, to all of our panel members and to Razi and Wede for uh, introducing the session and giving us a background on redress. So um, I want to invite anyone uh, who's uh, in our audience today, if, if you want, if you have any questions for any of our panel uh, members or for our speakers, um, uh, feel free to put your question in the chat or you're welcome to raise your hand and come off mute. Um, so give it a moment. Um, but uh, maybe I'll just to get us started and while we have uh, people uh, mulling over their questions in their head, I'll uh, ask a quick question. So um, in the beginning on, on one of the early, earlier slides, um, in the project description, it was explained that, um, you know, this research is jointly owned and um, um, the responsibility of the research and involvement of the community uh, or the research is jointly owned by the researchers and the community. Was it, uh, were there challenges in terms of getting the community on board um, or to get that buy-in to uh, participate um, or were they, you know, really eager to be part of this process? Hello. Hi, and Maybe some of my colleagues would be happy to kind of. Um, oh, maybe Wedi, did you want to go ahead with that one? Yes, please, Rosie. I can take on that one. Um, 
Yeah, I'll, I'll start us off. Um, thanks, thanks so much for that. So I think with within Redress, um, Redress itself was a, a, a research a study, I suppose, that came um, at the request of um, the NTD division within the Ministry of Health. And so um, the kind of um, from from the kind of Ministry of Health perspective, um, that really kind of um, drove kind of a lot of the focus and things with regards to the um, the, the research itself. Um, alongside that, we had different um, persons affected who were also um, involved as part of that um, um, development of the proposal. Um, and one of our colleagues, um, John, who sadly has since passed away, was really um, um, uh, important in shaping um, uh, a lot of kind of the, the direction of, of research and things like that. Um, and so that has, I suppose, kind of um, shaped from from really kind of um, before the, the study itself um, actually started kind of the direction and focus of the research. Um, and then again, throughout this this process, um, we, we we worked with a number of different um, stakeholders within um, the community, in addition to kind of um, the, the health systems actors and, and the community advisory board, which I, I just mentioned briefly, but didn't go into. And um, those community advisory boards were also really important in helping to shape and to guide um, different um, aspects um, and so those community advisory boards they included um, uh, sort of a range of different actors different community leaders and um, they had informal providers persons affected um, and sort of health systems actors and and they were also um, helped to shape things but also helped with a lot of kind of community engagement activities as well and um, so they they took on a range of different activities um, sort of creating awareness about um, skin NTDs um, through um, sort of different um, outreaches within um, marketplaces, but also in radio campaigns and things as well. But maybe some of my colleagues would like to add um, more detail to, to that. Thanks. Yes, Rosie, can I just add a bit? So um, there, there were not many challenges, like Rosie said, it was a request. Rosie, I don't right? know if you want to add anything to Yes. yes. Or... Can you hear me? I can, can you hear me. You. I can hear yes. you. Yeah. So Thank like you. Rosie said, it was like a request from the NTD's department. So that boosted the morale and made it even easier in terms of recruitment. So for the 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 the, the working with the community health um, team, we were linked. So they have these groups that like the traditional healers, the faith healers. They have an official group where they are registered. So in reaching to these people, these community actors made it easier through the county health teams. And also for the affected persons at the health facility, they have the health facility ledgers where they capture these affected persons. So in reaching to these affected persons at the community level, we went to the health facilities and were able to generate these affected persons' names, their contacts are there, and that's how we got in touch with these people. So it wasn't much of a challenge in recruitment and in interacting with them. And once they knew that we had gone through the formal health system, because there's a, a context uh, in our context, you have to go through the system, the health system. If you don't go through this system, I think we unfortunately just lost to you, uh, Wede, your, your connection, but um, we heard that, you know, you had connections um, within the formal health system, which really helped to strengthen your ability to connect with the community members and those affected um, and help support your work in that way. Um, so thank you for, for sharing um, that uh, information. Uh, we, there is a, a question in the in the chat that's uh, for uh, you, Wede. Um, perhaps I'll, um, hopefully, I guess, well, ho hopefully your internet connection has come back online. Um, so uh, we have a question from Ipsida Ghosh. Um, her question is, can you please elaborate uh, the process of body mapping? Uh, this method sounds interesting. Um, and if wedding, if your internet connection isn't great, maybe perhaps someone else on the team might be able to take that question. Yes, hello, am I clear now? Yes, yeah, now you're clear. 
Okay, um, so the body mapping is basically um, recruiting the affected persons, both male and females, because there are, con con there are some conditions that are unique to males, like the hydro seal. So what is being done or what we did, we actually recruited these persons, these affected persons, as I said, from the health facility ledgers, the NTDs, and facility ledgers, they were recruited and brought together. So we have a group, usually between six to eight persons, females in one room, and we have the same six to eight persons, minimum six, maximum eight in another room. So we do that to avoid people being body shamed or embarrassed to um, um, discuss the situation because if you put a man and a with male and females in one room, and you have a, a, a patient or an affected person who has hydrocy that is quite sensitive, and they wouldn't be engaging, they wouldn't be able to speak up. But where you have all men, and for example, one man come and say, I have hydrocy, and there could be someone else in that same group that has hydrocy, which makes it more relaxing, more convenient for that male to explain the situation, how they've been going through, how the stigma and discrimination, body shaming, being going through, and if you kind of comfortable uh, being grouped in male and females, right? So you just put them together and then you we gave them the marker with a, a sheet, flip on chart or poster sheet, and then they tend to draw the different body parts that are affected. So take for example, if someone has a really ulcer, they will draw the foot like we saw in the, 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 the poster. They will draw the foot and you saw in the picture, they put the red ink in, indicating a soul, a wound at that spot. And they will draw it at the location they've been affected. And when they draw it, and then they will discuss it, and then you will get other people in a group say, oh, I have the same condition, right? So it helps. To, to alleviate fear, it helps to alleviate uh, uh, um, the shame and, and, and discrimination, the 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 the, the, the discuss the experiences that they have in the different um um in the different communities. So bringing them together, you get more resource, made them to feel comfortable and made made them to understand that they are not just alone in this situation. They have other persons and listening to each other's story is a boost that they can have more confidence in themselves and in their conditions. Great, thank you, Eddie. Yeah, so it sounds like it's kind of a, it's used as a means to help get that conversation started um, and, and make people feel uh, a little more comfortable in, in discussing uh, some of the symptoms that they're experiencing with, with others who are also experiencing those symptoms. Um, hopefully, did that answer your question, um, Ipsita? It looks like there's also uh, a resource uh, in the chat. Uh, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you for uh, posting your question. And we have another question here from Anna, um, who writes, I found the presentation on the participatory methods employed in redress research project to be highly engaging. I would be grateful if you could delve deeper into the context of the research participation activism dynamics. Specifically, I'm keen on understanding the extent to which you believe these methods have empowered the community and have there been discernible changes at the community level? And have you noticed any improvements in the well being of individuals affected by skin and TDs? Um, is there a member from the team who would like to tackle that question? Thanks. Uh, just wondering if Emerson's internet um, is, if, if you were able to get that, Emerson. Maybe maybe if Emerson's um internet's um, um I can... not not cooperating at the minute, I'd be happy to start us off and, and Emerson if your if your internet comes back and you want to, to add to this or 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 Jella, if you want to add to this as well, please please feel free. Um I think um in terms of some of the changes um at the community level, um 
we've we've sought to sort of reflect back on some of the changes and um, we've done that with co-researchers through the ripple effect mapping um, where they um, reflected um, for the impact for themselves um, individually on I, I'm sort of being part of that of the process of being a, a co-researcher and Angela might want to reflect more on that um, but they also reflected on some of the impacts in the community um, in general um, and so there were a range of different and reflections on that. That's also something that we're looking into through um, our evaluation. As I say, the, the analysis is, is ongoing with that. But um, yeah, I, I would say that there have been um, a range of, of different ways in which things have um, uh, brought changes. And that's definitely coming through in, in a lot of our, our qualitative um, findings. People particularly reflected on, um, uh, on experiencing um, uh, impact or different forms of empowerment through being part of the peer support group through that process of um, meeting together, discussing together um, and reflecting on their experiences um, together. They also reflected on some of the um, economic aspects through having been able to be involved with um, the soap making and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. And that's also something that we will be looking into and exploring more in the quantitative part of the study, but the, the results of that are forthcoming. Um, but yeah, maybe Jala, uh, I wonder if you would want to reflect any more, um, maybe on your experiences with the ripple effect mapping or to the to the question in general. Can you hear me? Hello? Uh, yeah, Chala, we hear you. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, let me just show a little light on this. So uh, for this, it actually impacted a kind of knowledge to my work as a CSSS. Because uh, <clears throat> the issue of uh, patients affected they were stigmatized, so we observed that they were all hearing and they have no access to coming to the health facility to seek care. And uh, through the intervention of redress, we actually went into the community and the uh, co researcher went to the community. They were able to strategize a way that they would talk to the community people to, to have education and uh, also met the persons affected, talk to them. And that's how they were linked with the community directly, then to the facility for health seeking attitude. Because the attitude of stigma have kept them away from the health facility. For the fact that they have no idea of going to the facility for people to seek after them. They only have one notion. So we work on the thing they call change in mind and change in attitude. So that also help us because we also counsel them through that attitude. We also counsel them that, well, you are part of the society. You definitely need health care uh, uh, system. So that will help you tomorrow to be able to change from what you are feeling of. Because they share their feeling with us. They didn't have any, anything from us. They share their feeling with us. Great. Thank you, Jala, for providing uh, your, your perspective. Um, so we, we are uh, running short on time here. We've got one minute to go. Um, there is a question uh, in the chat from Guillermo um, asking uh, about knowledge gaps. Um, perhaps um, I can uh, copy this uh, question um, and uh, I believe, uh, Guillermo, if it's okay, I can uh, connect you and, and Razi and the team 
um, uh, to, to answer that question. Um, so we are coming up to the, the end of our session today, and I, I don't want to uh, keep people longer than we promised. So thank you, everybody, for joining us today to our, our wonderful speakers and our panel uh, members. It was uh, excellent to hear uh, your perspectives on this uh, multi-year project that you have all been working so hard on and um, has you know led to some wonderful impacts within the community and helping to address stigma for people who are impacted um, by these conditions. Um, so thank you to everybody for, for joining us today. I'm just going to quickly uh, release a poll just to get your perspectives on uh, the session. Um, but otherwise, I won't hold people longer. Um, and so thank you and, and have a good rest of your day.